I'm an 18 year old from the UK. This happened in February 2019 and I was 17 at the time. I got set up on a semi-blind date, we had seen photos of each other by a mutual friend, and this guy we'll call Cameron. He was 19. Cameron seemed like your average guy. Maybe a little into video games and anime and stuff, but overall nothing my friend told me about him seemed off in any way. Our mutual friend gave us each other's numbers and we texted for a night and decided to meet in the Starbucks the next day since we were both free. I never liked to meet new people this soon, but I figured since Cameron knew my friend, it couldn't possibly go wrong. But how mistaken I was. I arrived slightly early, ordered my coffee since I never liked guys to feel that they had to buy anything for me, and parked up on a seat facing away from the door and pulled out my book. I'm maybe there for 15 minutes chilling out and I get a text saying he's here. So I'm like, great, I'm at X table. I feel a presence over my shoulder and I turn my head slightly in acknowledgement. He must be here. Before I even get the chance to squeak out a hello, his lips latched onto my neck and he starts sucking my neck. Now I don't like when people are touching my neck at the best of times. I'm incredibly ticklish and I get super uncomfortable by people even being around my neck. The few times I've had massages or hair treatments I've been holding my neck just in discomfort and he's latched on it like a leech. And this man smells horrendous, kind of like dust personified. I freak out and elbow his chest to get him off of me. He lets go and looks at me with this weird expression on his face and laughs in just sort of a deadpan manner. It's really, really creepy and I started to become alarmed. I ask him what that was about and he just says, <laughs> I thought it was cute. Cute? In what world? I try to have a conversation. I'm like, okay, first impressions don't mean anything. Let's try and give him a chance. But he's just creepily staring at my chest. He says, wow, I didn't know Asians could have uh, chests like those. I better not let you go. That's a direct quote, and I cannot make this up. I'm distinctly uncomfortable, but... I don't want to just run away. He's giving me really weird vibes, so I go into the lady's bathroom and wait for someone else to come in. I ask her to help me get out of here undetected. I don't want this man following me home or some craziness. She of course agrees and she lends me her hat and scarf as it was February in the UK after all. And we come out of the bathroom together and she manages to help me sneak out of the back door of the Starbucks without him noticing. He asked my friend where I went, but I told my friend to never mention me again. I was too terrified. I know I probably didn't behave well, I should have just told him I was leaving, but honestly, I was just too scared. Dear guy who decided it was appropriate to suck my neck before he'd even said hello, please, never, ever text me again. Our little village was the kind of place where everyone knows everyone and I could count the amount of houses on two hands. We were a really quiet and close-knit community and nothing ever happened there. Proper out in the stick stuff. One night a few years ago, my mom and my stepdad had gone out to this concert and left me in charge of my little brother and the dog. I wasn't very old, about 14, and I felt really proud that my parents trusted me enough to do that. I thought I was a pretty cool big brother and thought we'd be doing cool babysitter stuff like staying up late, eating pizza, etc. I'm kind of glad we did because I don't know what would have happened if we hadn't. At about 10.30, the power cut out. I didn't think anything of it because the weather hadn't been great lately and I figured that had had something to do with it. I got some candles out of the cupboard and lit them and, and put some of our favorite songs on. As soon as I sat back down, Sonny, my little brother, turned to me and, being the weird little kid he was, told me very calmly that someone was outside. I was a little perturbed by him, but the dog hadn't done anything so I presumed it was just the neighbors or something. He just shrugged and went back to his drawings. There's a running joke in our house that you don't need a clock with a dog around because he is such a creature of habit that 
he will consistently get up at exactly the same time every night to tell you that it's time to initiate his nightly protocol to go to bed. It was about three quarters of an hour after the power went out when my dog decided that now was the time. I told Sonny to go get the dog his biscuit while I let him out for his pee. Now our kitchen is an extension to the original house and so as such has a flat roof that's comparatively low to the ground compared to the rest of the house and offers easy access to the bathroom window. As I open the door so the dog could do his thing, Sonny pushes past me in the doorway and whispers, I know you're out there. I'm calling the police. As he turned around with the biggest, proudest smile you'd ever seen on his face, there was a very distinct rustling coming from just above the doorway. I don't think I'll ever forget the way Sonny's face dropped when he looked just above my head. I looked up. The man sitting on the roof above me panicked, tried to kick me and then ran off into the next door's garden and presumably into the cornfield surrounding our village. I was scared stiff, and Sonny was bawling his eyes out. I ushered him inside as quickly as I could and got a knife from the kitchen. We both went to his room and I told him to try and get some sleep while I waited for our parents to come back. It was an agonizingly long four hours before they did. My stepdad immediately went outside to check and see if everything was alright. I heard them talking about how something had smashed the fuse box. Obviously we called the police, but they didn't come until later that day. They did a search of the immediate premises and found a makeshift bed in a nearby disused barn along with pictures of silhouettes of us in the shower through the frosted glass. I think it's pretty safe to say the whole experience definitely shook us up. We moved out as soon as we could, but I still shut curtains whenever I can, and I see shadows underneath every door I see. Sonny keeps quiet about it, but I'm not sure if that's just because his brain has cut it out or what. I'm a 26-year-old female from Michigan, but I was 20 at the time this took place. I live in a safe town and I was working in a Walmart in the next town over, which is an even safer town. I work midnights because I am definitely not a people person. Every day I would go home on my lunch to see my new puppy who, to this day, had kept me going through countless problems in my life. Working midnights, there was basically no cars on the road when I was going home on my lunches. It was when I was four miles from work at a stoplight that I noticed a car had been behind me for a mile or two. I drive like a grandma and always go the speed limit so there wasn't a reason for someone to stay behind me with clear open road all over. I keep on my way home, the car is still behind me another mile. I thought okay that's weird but maybe just a coincidence. I then had to turn on a side street which only has neighbors along either side for about a mile and you guessed it. The car turned too. I started to get worried but still brushed it off. Maybe they live down the street. It's when I turned into my neighborhood that I started to lose it when the car was still following me. I turned down my street but didn't pull into my driveway because I didn't want to lead this creeper to my house. So I kept driving and took another way back out of my neighborhood and the car was still tailing me. Just to be positive before I called 911... I drove through my neighborhood the same way as before, and he continued to follow again. I got back on the main road from the side street and dialed 911, crying because at that point I was terrified, and explained the situation to them. I headed back towards my work. She asked me where I was, and I told her the crossroads, and lucky me, there was a patrol unit a mile up. Yeah, and the car still behind me. She stayed on the phone with me and told me to pull into the 7-Eleven at the crossroads and the police were close to it. The car pulls in after me too, and the dispatcher later told me to turn my hazards on so the police know which car was which. The car must have seen the police car and tried to leave, but not today, buddy. They stopped him on his way out. I was just parked in a spot crying hysterically. An officer comes over and asks if I know a... Michael Stonebreaker, and I say I don't. 
The officer continues to say he has a good amount of illicit substances on him and this isn't his first arrest, so he'll be going away for a while. Why did he follow me? What was his motive? The officer also said the creeper said that he was following me because he thought I was his friend. Why didn't he pull up to me at the red light where we were stopped at? Why wouldn't he have tried to get my attention somehow? It was a very terrifying experience for me, even if it doesn't sound scary to some of you. And this taught me a valuable lesson. Pay close attention to your surroundings, day or night. Anything can happen, even in a safe town. I'm a college student working in retail and over winter break I was taking as many shifts as possible because first semester left me broke. In the first few weeks of January I had a slew of closing shifts at the register and on the sales floor they were always pretty dry. One night a man comes to the register with a return and then comes back later with a lot of random clothes. Not that weird to have someone with multiple transactions especially with the holidays having just finished. He's mid-fifties, a South Asian accent, and really distinct salt and pepper hair. Before I go any further, let me mention I'm also a guy and I'm gay, but I usually have a fake customer voice so you can't really tell, if you know what I mean. This man is talking to me for a while and I honestly feel weirdly comfortable with him. At one point, he asks about my pants size and asks me to step back from the register to see my lower body. A lot of people ask me about what size I wear usually to compare to their teenage sons, so this wasn't weird, but then he comments on my butt being big. I'm kind of half laughing like, oh, people told me that before, and I'm constantly thinking, why would I tell him that? He has to see it, and in that moment, I almost did again while my conscience is screaming not to do that. Before I stopped and said, oh, that's a bad idea, I'd get in trouble over a total joke. And he responds deadpan with, nobody's watching. Oh my god. He just keeps being conversational until I turn around to fold one of his items and he says, your friends were right about your butt. I turn around and he keeps repeating my name that he saw on my name tag. And I put my hand on the register while I wait for his receipt to print. He puts his hand on top of mine and I immediately twist into a handshake to try and normalize this. He says, It was nice to meet you, Andrew. And he walks out. And then he comes back in with more random stuff. Before he can try anything, another customer comes and suddenly he isn't talking. He mouths something to me at the register and leaves. And he comes back again once the next customer leaves. He asks for the bathroom goes and returns less than 30 seconds later. He asks if I work tomorrow. You have to understand my complete panic at this moment, and I just say the first thing that comes to mind, which is the truth. I say yes, and he smiles and leaves. I come into work tomorrow because I would get a lot of guff if I called out, and I work on the sales floor. I figured nothing is going to happen, and that was just a one-night event with a creeper. I joke about it with my coworker. And then he walks in, and my stomach plummets, and I sprint to the bathroom to hide. My walkie-talkie flies out of my pocket, but I'm too spooked to do anything except beeline to the bathroom. In there, I call every one of my coworkers on the job, but not a single one answers their phone because our managers are bogus about that, and the walkie is gone. I hear footsteps outside the bathroom, and I feel trapped. I feel like vomiting, but... Open the door and it's a white guy and his kid, thank God. I dash for my walkie and tell my manager the situation. She lets me take refuge in the back for ten minutes and then makes me return to work because making women's leggings look pretty is more important than a man prowling the store. He walks around for 45 minutes and my co-workers always stay close to me. My closest friend described it as a lion searching for prey in the store. He was searching every corner and I was thankful to have great co-workers to keep me on the move and surrounded wherever he came near. Eventually, he returned every item he bought with me yesterday. He told the cashier he'd come back again tomorrow and I didn't work so I'm not sure what became of him. 
and I never saw him again. I was arrogant to think as a man I would never be targeted like that by a creep. I won't be returning to the job this summer because my manager's response didn't sit really well with me, and hopefully I'll find a job where safety is the priority and not an afterthought. I was in college. My roommate was a born-again Christian and she invited me to her Bible study and church all the time. Eventually I went and I kept going. Wasn't a fan of the pastor but there were a lot of nice young adults who liked to have clean sober fun and I didn't drink or party so I felt like I fit in. But I didn't agree with everything they believed in, just the more normal stuff like God and helping the poor and not some other things. This one guy in the Bible study, Drew, was pretty quiet. He was good looking. He seemed like he knew everything about the Bible, which really amazed me. I thought, I know nothing about all this. He's so wise. I was 21 and he was 27. He wasn't a college student, he just worked, which I later learned. Maybe he didn't. We were going to go on a young adult retreat, and because I worked, I couldn't leave early on Friday to drive up to the mountains with the girls in the group. Mutual friends said that I could ride with Drew, so I said okay. On the way up, Drew was pretty quiet for the first hour. Not very friendly at all, and it was a long trip. But as we got closer to the mountains, he really warmed up. We got pizza and he paid, which was nice. Then he stopped the car, just so we could look at the stars. He even played some Brian McKnight. He was turning it into a date, but I didn't know it or see it that way then. I was starting to really like him and feel like we had a connection. He is just about to drop me off at the girl's cabin when he suddenly gets very serious and tells me that something happened between him and a, another girl in our church group, but she is telling lies about him and to not believe whatever I hear. He doesn't explain what actually happened and doesn't say who it is. I enter the cabin and all the girls are there and very quickly one girl, Bree, who is probably the youngest in the group at 19, tells all of us, Ladies, there is a wolf in sheep's clothing amongst us at this retreat. Now if you don't know church folk, they get very dramatic and talk like this all the time. So I just thought, okay, here's some drama. She tells us this story about how she was talking to some guy here, but he started stalking her and wouldn't take no for an answer, and he even threatened her sister. Now my spidey sense is up, and I realize this must be what Drew was telling me about. The church group doesn't know who it is, because she won't say, because she doesn't want to gossip, and she says leadership will handle it. Well, Drew eventually leaves the weekend retreat early, and there goes my ride back, I thought. I don't know if he was asked to leave or what. That week, Drew asked me to hang out, and we do. I still like him and don't know who to believe. On our hangouts, we don't really do anything. He takes me to the mall and reads the Bible to me. Okay, cool. Then he parks his car on some suburban lookout, top of the world type of thing, and just said he is a view guy who really likes views. I am not one to be impressed by suburban lights, so I'm just like, okay, well, this is boring. I give him another chance. I invite him to come see a play with me. When he comes, he immediately meets one of my friends, Brian. Brian introduces us to his boyfriend, Nick. I'm in theater, many gay friends. Well, for the majority of the rest of the date, Drew lectures me about gays are going to suffer and... I must not really love them if I don't stop them to tell them the truth about the gospel. I eventually cry because it is this ugly argument in this car we're having for hours in the parking lot of a Panera. I say I want to go home. This is basically the worst date ever. I don't agree with what he says. He also tells me I need to give up my dream of being an actress because what if the Lord doesn't want me to do that? Theater is something I did my whole life. Not to mention my major and his reasons for giving it up had nothing to do with the impracticality of it, but because of God. This guy was turning out to be nuts. I get home and I offer to make us some cocoa to just kind of end things as friends, or at least on a better note. I know I'll see him at church and we have mutual friends or in the same Bible study. Things got weird. He tried to get intimate with me, but then also blame me for tempting him. 
how with my tear-strained and exhausted face. I ended up crying again. I just wanted him to go home, but I was so emotionally exhausted, I didn't know what to make of this. He calls and texts me that week, and I don't respond. Then it's Sunday night. I'm talking to my friend Tim, who no longer goes to this church anymore. I tell him I went on a date with Drew. And before I can tell him how it went, Tim says, What? That guy's crazy. You need to abort that mission. Tim tells me that he is close with Bree and her family, and Drew is a stalker and threatened Bree's sister. I don't know what to believe because it sounds like Tim believes this just based on Bree's story. I hang up and call my mom to try to tell her what happened, what Tim told me about Drew and how it was such weird timing considering what happened with me. While I'm on the phone with my mom, I get a knock at the door. It is 10pm on a Sunday night. I look out, but no one's there. I go to get my roommate and ask her if she can just sit with me in the front room because I'm freaked out and think someone's there. There is another knock at the door. I open it, and it's Drew, and he looks all in a frenzy. I ask him what he's doing here, and he said he just needed to talk to me, and I wasn't answering my phone, which was because I was generally busier early in the day. The conversation is getting long, and my roommate is still sitting there, so I tell her she can go back to her room if it's okay. I let him come in because I am conditioned to be kind of overly nice, and this was a big mistake. We start talking, and as soon as my roommate is gone, he pulls out a knife and starts saying how he was worried my neighbors did something to me because I wasn't answering his texts, and he didn't know what kind of situation he'd be walking into. I have zero fighting skills, no experience in this situation at all, so I calmly say as casually as possible, Hey, can you put the knife away? It makes me feel uncomfortable. He asked me if I want the knife, and I say, no, I just want to pretend it isn't here. I somehow talk him down, get him to leave. I think I convince him he still has a shot with me somehow. The next morning, my mind is clear, and I feel like I need to tell my mom what happened. She has me tell my dad, who has me tell the church youth leader and security at my apartment. I tell a cop the whole story, and he says that this guy is definitely a stalker, and I will see him again unless the police call him. I say it's fine, I think everything will be okay, no need to call. I just didn't want more drama. I'd never talked to a policeman about anything before and I was still processing and didn't understand that this was serious. And that was my mistake. The next night, I went to a party, another church related one, but Drew is not supposed to be here. He told me before that he wasn't going. Well, there he is and I decide to leave, but my 21-year-old self doesn't think to ask to have someone walk me out. I figured if I leave and he's still here, problem solved. I didn't anticipate him realizing I left and following me. I'm walking to my car in a dark apartment parking lot, and I hear him call out my name. He's following me. I start running, and I say I don't want to talk, and he begins giving chase. I'm clicking my car to open, thinking this is how white girls die, because... She didn't let the cop call the stalker because she's dumb. Thankfully, my car unlocks. I get in and drive away. Problem is, this guy knows where I live. I move out two weeks later and I block him on all social media and my phone. Drew eventually somehow managed to make another Facebook profile and sent me a message that summer saying he was praying for me and he had forgiven me for trashing him to people even though I still never told anyone that happened except for the useless pastor who did nothing. And that was the last I saw or heard of him. Unfortunately, this predator continued to serve at that church in the junior high ministry of all places, around many young girls. No one on church leadership listened to me or to Bree, who both complained that this guy was stalking us. I never reached out to Bree to let her know what happened to me, and I never got to hear her story in detail but I told the youth adult pastor about the knife and him trying to get intimate with me and how scared I was. Thankfully, I don't go to that church anymore. This was all a pre-Me Too movement, and what sucks is that I've had a few experience with crazy religious dudes. This was the first, but definitely not the last. I'm still trying to come to terms with why that is.
When I was in my early 20s, I worked as a bank teller for a couple of years before moving on to my current industry. I've been having a run of self-induced bad dating luck. Self-induced meaning I was choosing fellas that were fast, dirty, and fun while expecting to find long-lasting love. There was this guy who was a manager of a local country western style nightclub that did their banking business with the bank I worked at that was not my type and totally the opposite of the kind of fellas that I had been going for. When he started coming inside the bank for the club's deposits, we had some fun back and forth banter that led to flirting over some weeks. Well, he eventually asked me out on a date and I thought, whatever, he's witty and I really enjoy talking to him, so I said yes. Clearly my normal type wasn't working out for me. I was gun shy after my failed dating experiences, so I suggested lunch to keep things light and casual. He asked if he could still pick me up and as a sucker for chivalry, I said yes. So he picked me up from the bank's front parking lot. In hindsight, I realized what a bad career decision it was to date a bank customer, let alone get in the car with him right in front of the building. 30-year-old me would kick my 20-something-year-old butt. The front parking lot was for customers only. The back lot was for employees only. The back lot had three rows, with third being furthest away from the bank. You probably had to walk 50 yards or so from the back door of the bank to the third row where I parked. Things seemed totally fine when I got in the car with him. It was pretty typical in terms of awkwardness considering it was a first date. He drove me to a pub slash grill downtown and that's when things got weird. When we sat down it was like some other dude took over his body. He started telling me about his most recent breakup and ex-girlfriend, how she ended up being a psycho. She stalked him, took out a restraining order against him, caused him to lose his job, broke his heart, the works. On and on and on. I really don't think I said more than ten words the whole time, and some of those were to order my food. He talked about his drama the entire time. So, I'm sitting there across the table from Motormouth, and he suddenly says that we should cut the date short so I can get back to the bank in time. He says it will take us too long to get back if we don't leave now. The ride back, he was dead silent until we pulled back up into the parking lot. He tells me he had an amazing time and that he hopes we can do it again. Now, I'm fully aware people can get super nervous on first dates and that many people struggle from social anxiety, so I'm not totally out at this point. I gave the dude my number. Then I thanked him for lunch and went back inside, feeling overwhelmed and very puzzled. We were not allowed to have our cell phones out of the bank, so I put it where I always did inside my bag that was inside my locked teller cabinet. I took a break later that afternoon and when I checked my phone, I had well over 20 missed calls and text after text after text after text from this guy. He started out sweet and then when I didn't answer his calls or nice texts, deteriorated into downright nuts. Why aren't you answering? Is it over already? Should I come back to the bank so we can talk? Etc. I was freaked but... At work, I just threw my phone back in my bag and tried to shake it off. I was mentally beating myself up for my bad choices for the rest of the day. When the bank closed that evening, I locked up my teller drawer and walked out to my car. There was a single red rose tucked into my windshield wiper. I yanked my phone out of my bag and the last text I had from him was, I hope you like your surprise. I didn't drive my car to meet this guy for our date. He picked me up in the customer lot. I got to work every day an hour before opening. There's no way he could know what I drove without doing some serious detective work. I snatched the rose off of the car, threw it down, and got out of there fast. I drove around in circles before I went home because I was scared of being followed. I blocked his number. He didn't come back in the lobby again after that day. He started going through the drive-up window. A few months later, after we hadn't seen him for a while, one of the other club employees told us that he had been fired for stealing money. I never told anyone at the bank about it, especially my boss. Sure makes me wonder about all those stories he told about his ex on the lunch date. I told my current boyfriend this story a year or two ago, and he thinks the guy had probably been watching me for a while before he asked me out, and that's how he knew which car was mine. Unfortunately, I may never know.
It all happened back in the 90s. I would say 96 or 97, and I was something around 14 years old. I had this close friend, Carl. Carl was like a big brother to me, sometimes playful, sometimes a bully. As most of the boys who grew up in the 90s, we spent all of our free time playing video games, watching cheesy horror flicks, and roaming around the neighborhood on our bikes, all stickered up like motorcycles. Once in a while, my mother would take us to my grand's. They lived in the countryside just outside of our town. After having our meal, we would usually gear up, grab some snacks and juices, and jump on our bikes to go to the lake. To do so, we had to ride till the end of a bumpy road, then go through a sunflower's field. The lake was downhill from there. And every time we'd cross the field, a building in the far would intrigue us. It seemed abandoned. It was a typical factory building from the 80s. We could see a lot of windows were jammed, some parts of the roof had holes, and the sun was beaming from it. I swear we came across this place 30 times at least. Sometimes we'd come closer and play truth or dare. I always end up being the chicken as Carl was really willing to check in there. One day though, I was dared. We parked the bikes against a wooden fence and then we started the trespassing. Outside the building, a dozen of rusty cars, engines out, some seats put on the floor, some others burnt or mauled. The entrance was poorly barricaded, but enough to make us climb up a pipe to the first window we saw. The inside was shocking. It looked like if people stopped, all that they were doing to rush out. Tools were disposed on workshops. A car was hung up by a huge chain and it was still slightly moving. The only thing that yelled abandon was the tremendous amount of dirt and dust. I remember Carl found an iron pole and started swinging like he was a video game character or whatever. I knew him. Even if he played it cool, I felt he was scared and tried to act tough. We headed to what seemed to be the administrative aisle. It was upstairs. We had to take some thin iron stairs, threatening to detach from the staircase on every breath. The gloominess intensified. This place was basically a long hallway with offices all along. Again, it could have been functional the week before, because except the dust and the stuffy smell, everything was left untouched. In a room, we found a newspaper from 1984 or 85, and it made us compute that they had bailed out this year. What impressed me the most was the family pictures and frames that we found in some offices. That was creepy. Who would leave work forever without taking back pictures of your kids and women? At this time, a picture meant something. Smartphones didn't exist, so if you lost it, it was done. When we took back the stairs, Carl saw a small wooden door under the staircase, and it led to a basement. That place looked inhabited. The floor was covered with trash, feces, and it smelled like urine. In a corner, we found the actively decaying corpse of a cat. A green curtain was hanging and masked what we were about to see. Behind the curtain, we stared in awe in front of a man lying on the floor. He was gibbering words we didn't understand and didn't directly look at us. Another man was facing a wall. Although it was clear we were there, I even stumbled in an empty can, he was still facing that wall. To this day, I don't know what he was doing. Now it was clear that the laying guy was drooling and had his eyes completely covered red. We ran out of there. I recall jumping on my bike and seeing a silhouette behind a window on the first floor. And we never told the story to our parents as we were too afraid of being grounded. Last year I chatted with Carl on social media as we hadn't seen each other for 15 years. I asked him if he remembered that day and he told me, Of course I remember. I was... Soiling my pants, dude, I didn't want to go there at all, and I never thought that you would say dare. For background, my family moved to the countryside from the city when I was about 7 years old, and I'm 21 now. Both my parents had grown up in the suburbs and had lived in the capital of our state for about 10 years before we moved. It definitely took us some time to get used to the train tracks that ran by our house, the wild animals, the weird but kind neighbors, and the odd visitors. Another thing is that you have to get off the main road and turn onto a long gravel drive to get up to our house. 
We can see the entire length of the driveway from certain points in our yard, which is about three acres. A few years after we moved in, my dad got a promotion at work and, as a result, started to go to conferences and business trips that lasted from a few days to a week, at least a couple of times a year. My mom felt nervous about being home with two young kids. I was ten and my brother was six, and so we decided to get a dog. We knew we wanted a big dog, but something that would be gentle with my brother and I. After a few weeks looking at shelters, we took home Rocky. He was nine months when we took him home, and already pushing 70 pounds. We believe he's a German Shepherd mixed with some northern or mountain breed. We aren't sure to this day, but he's a massive red-colored dog with a long black muzzle and ears, a fluffy tail that he carries over his back, and a white stripe up his nose. It wasn't long until he was 100 pounds and an absolute force to be reckoned with. Even though he was very gentle with both my brother and I, loved our cats, and was a big ball of joy around anyone we brought into our house, he tended to be very territorial and aggressive with other dogs and very protective of us, especially of my mom and I. Once, the electric company came to do work on the telephone poles in our property, without telling us first, and after 20 minutes they finally had to call us because Rocky had them trapped in their truck and was just jumping up and barking at their windows. I doubt he would have really attacked them if they'd gotten out of their trucks, but it was more than enough to make them think twice. This protective instinct came in very, very handy one day. It was summertime, my dad was at work, and my mom was home with my brother and I, since she was a teacher and off for the summer with us. My mom was working in our garden, and my brother and I were playing close by with Rocky watching over all of us. Rocky, all of a sudden, sounded the alarm, throwing his head up in the air and barking and howling. He makes a deep woo-woo noise. I looked up to see a dirty white pickup truck pull off from the main road and into our driveway. This wasn't necessarily alarming at first, as people sometimes used our driveway to turn around when they got lost. But the white pickup slowly ambled up our driveway, and I could see something strange in the bed. It was lumpy and discolored, but I couldn't really tell what it was until we pulled all the way up to our house, where our other cars were, and honked the horn to get our attention. It was meat. Giant red chunks of meat with some of the limbs of various animals still attached. It was the creepiest thing I'd ever seen. Just a grizzled, scraggly man in his early fifties, driving a pickup truck full of meat in the southern July heat. I immediately just got a really, really bad vibe from this guy, and I remember my mom telling my brother and I to go inside, and we did, but watched out the glass door. Rocky had surprisingly been quiet at that point, but was now next to my mom, and she had her hand around his collar. The guy rolled down his window and asked my mom if she wanted to purchase some meat. My mom said no, and to please leave our property. Instead, he went on about different types of meat and asking how much we wanted, beef, venison, pork, etc. My mom asked him to leave again, but instead, he decided to get out of the nasty white pickup. As soon as his feet were on the ground, Rocky went ballistic, barking and snarling. This finally made the guy stop. He looked at Rocky, looked at my mom, and asked, Does your dog bite? And my mom, deathly serious, replied, Only if I tell him to. The guy took one more look at Rocky and, I'm guessing, decided not to mess with the giant, snarling beast. He got back in his truck, backed up, and headed back down our driveway. I don't know if he was really selling meat or not, but apparently he'd been around to our neighbors who also had just gotten a really bad vibe from him. We'll never know what he was really up to with those giant slabs of meat in the bed of his pickup truck. Maybe he was just a weird guy trying to sell some sketchy meat. Maybe he was looking for something else. We never saw Meat Man and as we started to call him again though. Rocky is still kicking it by the way. He's almost 15 and completely deaf but he's still out in the yard on summer days watching over us. Ah!
Okay, outcasts, welcome to Insanity Collection. Today's story has arrived like clockwork. Isabeth isn't too fond of the family timepiece with its murder of Pearlface, and there's good reason she isn't. Its existence has grave consequences for her. <laughs> I call this one Family Secrets. When I was young, we were left unattended. My friends and I rode our bikes deep into the fields and returned at our leisure. We rarely played in the same location and often ditched it after a few days. With each new adventure, we drifted further from civilization and one day we struck gold. Figuratively speaking, of course. We came across a massive field which seemed to stretch endlessly in all directions. It appeared to be abandoned farmland, and the grasses and weeds had grown past our wastes. The entire area was completely silent, as if we had broken the sound barrier, and to some degree our voices seemed several octaves higher than normal. Whenever we went there, we lifted our bikes over a rotted wooden fence, and then we pedaled through the field. It quickly became one of our favorite locations. Our last excursion stuck with me the most. It was the day we discovered the farmhouse. I have no idea how we never noticed it before. It was just there, but somehow we overlooked it. We rode over to the house to observe it up close, and it appeared more beautiful from a distance. The age was clear in the peeling paint, the shoddy shutters, and the broken windows. The farmhouse was two stories tall, possibly three, and had a large veranda smudged with grime. The porch extended around the house, and we noticed a rickety porch swing creaking back and forth on a rusted chain. There was no wind. While I was left pondering this, my friends abandoned their bikes by the wayside and dashed across the dirt road. I abandoned my bike as well and followed them hesitantly. I turned to my left and right. Just like the field, the dirt road extended into oblivion. Guys, what if somebody lives here? I asked. My main concern was disturbing the homeowner and getting kicked off the property. Oh, come on, there's nobody here, George called back. George was the most adventurous of the three of us. His confidence usually got us all in trouble. I decided to trust him and crossed to the other side of the dirt road. Both my friends were already standing on the porch. Can you see inside? Ryan, my other friend, shook his head. There's a thick curtain in the way. It smells really musty over here. I had to agree with him. It smelled old and decrepit. The porch above all else seemed to be in the worst state of decay, but somehow it held our weight. Curiously, we wandered all the way around the house. If anyone lived there, they would have heard us, because the wood squeaked terribly. Each step made me cringe, but when nobody confronted us, I eventually relaxed. None of us voiced it, but we all wanted to break into the house. It seemed too soon for that. We'd have to wait a week or so. We had to be absolutely sure that the farmhouse was vacant. The backyard was nothing spectacular. It was overgrown like the rest of the land. There was a crumpled shed several yards away, along with a rusted pickup. We put off exploring them and continued around the house until we reached the front once more. We scurried off to collect our bikes, but we became sidetracked when George discovered an opening in the lattice which led underneath the porch. Naturally, we were beyond excited. I inched myself halfway through the opening and confirmed that we could easily fit. That's when I noticed the look in George's eyes. He was about to make a bet. I bet that I can crawl through there faster than you, he insisted with crossed arms. I lost our previous bet, so I needed to redeem myself. Betting was our thing, and it often involved races, whether on our bikes or on foot. Because of this, Ryan always kept a stopwatch handy. Fine, I didn't bother creating ultimatums. Nothing scared us. I'll go first, I offered. I wanted the lay of the land, so George couldn't rig anything. I crouched down beside the opening and waited for Ryan to retrieve the stopwatch from his bike. The dirt was clammy beneath my hands, and I noticed lichens growing along the foundation of the house. 
I tried not to think of spiders and snakes. We had done worse things than this. Wait a second, I want my eyes to adjust, I told my friends. I didn't want to risk bumping my head against anything. Are you ready? Ryan muttered, raising the stopwatch. Yeah. Okay, maybe I was a bit nervous. Go! I forced myself through the opening and felt the lattice clawing at my clothes. I tugged my hips inside and took a hard right, crawling straight for the first turn. Once I reached it, the tunnel narrowed and I was forced to army crawl. I felt the grime smearing into my arms and soaking into my clothes. I pressed onward and dug my shoes into the ground, practically dragging myself along. As soon as I reached the second turn, I felt a draft, but I tried my best to ignore the chilly air. Even so, the air seemingly grew colder, especially from my left, until it felt like ice was pressing against my ribs. The longer stretch before me must have been the back porch, and I felt disheartened when the tunnel remained narrow. If anything, it seemed narrower than before. As soon as I passed the halfway mark, I heard frenzied scuffling. The tunnel was too narrow for me to turn around, but I knew it was one of my friends, probably George. I felt him grab my ankle, jerking me sharply backward. I caught myself on the lattice and kicked backward angrily, hitting my friend square in the face. You cheater! I screamed. I army crawled faster than ever before. My friend was persistent though and I heard him right behind me. I blocked everything out and dug my arms mercilessly into the ground, clawing myself through the tunnel until I burst out of the opening. I was breathing heavily and covered head to foot with nasty red clay. What the hell is the matter with you? I screamed at Ryan. Ryan was standing there timidly, and of course George was nowhere to be seen. They were both cheaters. Ryan was quivering, and he extended the stopwatch to me. You were under there for 27 minutes. What? No, I wasn't. I snatched the stopwatch from Ryan and stared down at 27 minutes, 32 seconds. You guys are messed up. Ryan clearly never reset the watch. I stopped shouting as soon as Ryan began crying. That's not funny, Sam. We were worried. We were calling for you and you weren't responding. George went in there about 10 minutes ago to search for you. I didn't know what to think of this. I stomped over to the opening and began calling for George, but received no response. You guys never called for me, I replied stubbornly, glaring at Ryan, who was still sobbing. Ryan allowed the stopwatch to keep running. When another 15 minutes passed, we were sick of waiting for George. We'll just go back in and find him. You can go to the right, it's more open that way. I'll go to the left, we'll meet in the middle. Ryan seemed reluctant of the plan. I convinced him to squeeze inside after me, and we split up. This was all George's fault. He probably threatened Ryan to go along with it. I was gonna kick George's ass when we got out of here. When I crawled beneath the back porch, I heard scuffling ahead of me. George, I called. No, it's me. I narrowed my eyes in confusion when I met Ryan in the middle. Did you find George? No, did you? My heart skipped a few beats. No. By this point, we were both unnerved and I had to help Ryan turn around. I couldn't go backward through the tunnel since it was so narrow. It took us several minutes, but we reached the opening without a hitch. We lingered around the front porch and wondered if we had missed George somehow. That was the irrational side of me thinking. Those tunnels barely fit one person, let alone two. It would have been impossible for George to pass us going in the opposite direction. We waited until nightfall for George to reveal himself, but he never did. We called out to him and warned him that we were leaving. It was growing so dark, we didn't want to linger any longer. We crossed to our bikes, covered in that foul red clay, and warned him one final time. Reluctantly, we pedaled away from the farmhouse and followed the dirt road home. Our parents were forced to believe us when George didn't return that night. The cops were called, and the next morning, we led them to the field and the lonely farmhouse. We described what happened in detail and watched them knock on the front door, waiting tirelessly for someone to answer. When nobody did, they went to investigate the opening in the lattice. The cops were too big to fit. While they were searching the perimeter, I went to retrieve George's bike from where we left it, but it was gone. George was never found, and the case was closed. Eleven years later, there was a development in the long-forgotten case. Our city went through a period of rapid urbanization, and our county began buying up the adjacent farmland. The old farmhouse was demolished, but there was a sickening discovery at its core. The entire foundation was layered in dried blood and scattered with small bones. The bones belonged to children and were covered in harsh bite marks.
Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to tickle that bell icon to get notifications.